Okay, so one uh, preface for today. This is in many ways my favorite week of the semester, but it's also probably the most depressing week of the semester. If you've looked at the papers for today, I think you will share my sentiment. Uh, so what you know, what I'd like to do is basically take a step back from all of the good things, hopefully, that we've learned this semester. We've learned how to rigorously apply various research methods and you know, the context in which it's appropriate to apply them and all of this. And we've spent all our time until now on, on doing that. But it's inescapable to me that um, you know, science and research, no matter how rigorous, is ultimately a human process with humans involved. Um, and you know, despite all our best efforts, uh, and I'm sure yours will also be best efforts from now on in all your research, uh, it's still impossible to separate the human researcher from the process of doing research. So the papers for today and for Thursday this week are basically examples of this. Uh, it's, it's an attempt for us to step back and reflect on you know, really ultimately how hard it is to do science right, even when you have the best intentions, uh, presumably, and how much subjectivity there is in the process, um, you know, all, all other things considered. So I guess, wait, so let's see. Uh, Nikita, how are you feeling? Is it you okay to present or you'd rather not? That's okay too? Uh, I'll actually present it on Thursday if that's okay. Okay, sounds good. So, yeah, uh, good. So, what we'll do then, there's a few, there were three papers I wanted us to discuss today, but I don't know that we had a chance to get volunteers because I send them around probably too late. Sorry about this. Um, so, instead, let's take some time to actually look at these papers. Um, let's do the two, so not Nikita's, not the one that uh, she volunteered to present. Let's do the other two. I actually have printouts if you'd rather read a printed version. Um, and um, you have the electronic names and whatnot, so you can just find them. Let's look at each of these two papers, discuss them in turn. So, you know, let's spend roughly half the meeting uh, reading and discussing one paper and the, uh, the other half reading and discussing the second one. I want to start with the one that I thought was most depressing. Um, which is, uh, I think, the first one. Let me make this bigger. Not the retracted one, the other one. This one. Let's start with this. So the plan is, and here, I have lots of printouts. The plan is to maybe spend, I don't know, 10 minutes browsing through some of this. If you haven't already, if, if you've done this already, we can skip directly to discussing. Um, do, do, we, do you think it's useful to spend some time looking at the paper or do we, are we ready to start talking about it? It's going to be more than five minutes. I actually didn't see the time. So I didn't spend any time looking at that. Show of hands if it's useful to spend some time looking at the paper. I won't be offended. Okay, okay. So let, let's do that. I, anybody want print out printed versions since I have them? Yeah. So we'll take 10 ish and uh, look at this. The important parts are introduction and the discussion section. You could skip basically through all of the methods. Now, if this won't get you depressed, I don't know what will. Thanks. Should I post the link to this in the Slack channel? Is that useful?
Do you remember this logo when we read this last time? Yeah, I think I mentioned that in the book. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But I did a lot of work in a year later. Must have not been. Look at the dates. It was maybe it wasn't published yet. Okay. The dates are August 2022. Oh, it's not like the archive. Yeah. So it's very recent. I have one question. So the turn of the key came up with different conclusions, but there's no ground truth, right? So they presented this problem, but they 
research themselves do not have the conclusion because if they did, they there's no grand truth. It's an open question, but they were given the same data set mm -hmm. and the same question or hypothesis to test on that data set. It's like me giving you all some data set and a homework assignment. It's like that. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, you know, 73 groups of students given the same homework assignment on the same data. Perhaps I'm pessimistic, but do you think it's expected? Uh, is as you said in the beginning of the class, we're humans, we have our own beliefs, and even though we try to be logical and try to follow methodology, intrinsically we are always going to introduce. That's the point of the, let's talk about it. Let's yeah, talk about yeah. it together. I think they, they try to control for that to some degree. Um, I don't know if I'm going to measure this, but they do say that like, only a future comfort of race is explained by mm -hmm. biases, pre-existing biases. Oh, I mean, so, but that, seems, that, that seems like very difficult to measure. Uh, their uh, analysis of any race is that most of the variance is due to uh, just like differences in the user. Although I don't know if these things are like, they seem like they could be very interrelated, like differences in research search method or research methods could be informed by bias. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure those things are especially separable. Uh, Zoom folks, is there sound on? Yeah, you sound great. All right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, let, let's talk about this. Like Luke and, and Paolo take this off. What's the paper? Let's start from the obvious. What's the paper? What does what does the study do? They use the same data and sort of the same hypothesis or quest research question to a group of like seventy three research teams, right? And then ask them to answer the question. Test the hypothesis. Yep. Like the so seventy three groups of researchers, experts, mind you, in in the field. They were all given the same homework assignment. They were given a shared data set and one hypothesis, specific hypothesis to test, namely that um, hypothesis is that more immigration will reduce public support for government provision of social policies. That's the hypothesis. And they had some good data that they talked about in the paper uh, on this, the data that could be used to test the hypothesis. They gave this all out to 73 groups of researchers. Okay? And then researchers came back with some analyses of the data, some models that were used to test this hypothesis, and one bit conclusions of their analyses. Like, the, you know, people did a lot more, but they were also uh, asked to summarize the their entire analysis into one bit. You know, does this actually support the hypothesis? Uh, does the data, I don't know, contradict the hypothesis, or is there no evidence, or can we not test the hypothesis? And and the really mind blowing finding to me was then uh, this figure from the paper that illustrates this. Like here, you have um, so each point is one of the models built by the researchers, I think, and the y-axis is the um, effect size of that difference or that effect of, uh, what is it? Um, of immigration on public support for government social policy. Okay, so how large is the effect of immigration on uh, uh, government, uh, on the public support for government public social policy? Right, so it could be positive, it could be negative, or it could be neither. And the mind blowing finding of this paper to me is, that there is just no agreement whatsoever between these teams. So the same question on the same data, which is often a source of variation, right? You know, people 
even, even when rarely people answer the same question or test the same hypothesis, most often they use different data right, to do this. So you know, maybe the findings, the inconsistencies in the findings have to do with you know, the different samples and whatnot. But here they were given literally the same data, the same hypothesis, yet they came back with you know, conclusions that were absolutely all over the place. There is no agreement. Isn't that wild? Is it, is it because you're testing the very complex hypothesis in your So I feel like this will not be the case if you're doing something simple. Like if you're trying to address a problem like this one, um, where there are many variables at play. But so this, I agree, this is a complex question, but it's a realistic one. It's one that, you know, researchers genuinely have been asking, uh, there have been prior studies on literally the same hypothesis. Um, but it's, sort of a, it's a realistic thing that would come up in this area in the course of normal science. That's something that people care about. Like it's, uh, most problems that are important are difficult, I guess. So we can always you know, simplify the problem enough to have a really clean answer to it. Most interesting problems are uh, the ones that involve humans and policy and whatnot, and those are often very complex. So I agree, it, it is a complex question, I agree. But I, I think it's realistic, so it, it doesn't take away from you know, the validity of it. But kind of following up on what Daniel said, it seems like the conclusion of this paper is that researchers should communicate uncertainty more, right? If you're not certain, you shouldn't just give the confident answer, right? But what astounded me is this paragraph on page three, when they say that at any point, the, the analysts that they recruited for this study could have changed their preferred methods and resubmit the results and change their conclusion and no team Voluntarily did so. Did they believe they were right? <laughs> Every single person thought they were right. Like, I mean, once you submit it, it, haven't you probably already gone over it? <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. I don't know. It's not necessarily that they didn't reconsider ever. I mean, everybody's probably thinking that everybody else is wrong. It's my intuition. <laughs> I agree. It's just alarming. I don't know. I, I, I feel like people can come up with different answers for like ideological reasons, and that's obviously not this. What happened in this case, at least based on their measures, so it's not necessarily entirely surprising to me that for a complex problem like this, you could come to different conclusions. Although with the same data, it is kind of that's surprising. And you know, the best part still, I think, uh, is so you know. The way they set this up, they were able to uh, record and measure all of the things that all of these teams did differently. Okay, so you know, they talk about this at length in the method section. Uh, you know, all of the things they recorded, uh, what they know about the researchers themselves, and you know their prior biases and whatnot about the question. They've given them surveys and whatnot before recruiting them for, or before giving them this task. But also all of the like small low level decisions people made, you know, like how, what variables they use, how they filter their data, you know, what kind of model did they run? You know, did they account for hierarchy or not? Whatever, like all of the kinds of things that they did in the process of analyzing the data and, and testing the hypothesis. They recorded all of these and then um, built this model to try to explain the variance in people's answers based on all of these things that they had measured, right? So surely, surely must come from somewhere, right? You know, and, you know, and maybe the people that, I don't know, found negative effects were all using the wrong kind of models, right? Or you know, maybe they had not filtered outliers or, you know, whatever else, right? So this must be some, uh, you know, objective, the reason why they've arrived at these very different conclusions, right? Um, and the absolutely amazing finding uh, to me is that uh, they explain, even with all of these many variables that they computed, I don't know, they talk about hundreds of variables, I think, that they reported ultimately. Even with all of these, they explain about 5% of the variance in people's answers to this question. 
So really, by and large, they have no idea why people arrive at such different conclusions, even when accounting for anything they could think of and anything they could measure. Isn't that wild? Like how is that possible? I mean, if, if we accept the conclusion of this paper, does that mean that we should not accept the conclusion of this paper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I mean, another point is, I don't know, I typically don't see scientific papers that are like, this is the absolute truth. And maybe, uh, I don't know, I should read more, <laughs> but I feel like scientists already are pretty, they're like, this adds more evidence to or other things like that, rather than saying this is definitely Yeah, I agree with this. I think this is one of the takeaways that you know we, we need a lot of replication and whatnot in meta studies to trust anything. But, but but even then, you know, think of all of these people as replications, right? Of the original study. You know, 73 teams, you know, name the first one the original study and the other 72 replications. But right? there's they're all just so wildly different. But it's not wildly different. If you go back to the bigger one, yeah. and this is, to me, this is looks like a normal distribution. So you have a very extreme, very different results, and you have the common, uh, like, 57%. But, but so how in the, can in the middle and then that's the majority like I mean people may make very different mistakes and uh, when they but it's actually rare for people to make mistakes and when that happens you have those two extreme conclusions but the majority of people can still get some still uh, similar results. But they, they can't, both, so these ends of the distribution, they can't both be right. Yeah, but that's still fine because that's that's the error. Right, I guess, so maybe like, maybe if, the, if the, there was like a positive effect in the distribution, I think what you're saying, the distribution might be centered over like the positive portion. But here the distribution, it's, it's some kind of vaguely normal distribution maybe. Uh, and the distribution is centered over the middle, which means that maybe there isn't much of an effect. Uh, I, is that- Yeah, you, you can still draw the conclusion that this, uh, the immigration has no effect on the political I based on this because uh, if you think about the error and uh, also think about the, the majority, uh, then you, you, you sort of, mm -hmm. and you can also have very different shape of the meter. You can have the like 50 or 60% of people have this negative uh, results and you have the maybe 10 or 20 and full no, effects and also tend to continue to have positive effects. That's that's another shape of the normal distribution. So your, your argument is essentially because the true effect is probably relatively small, oh, this is all just normal variation around zero that we're observing because of these different... Uh, my argument is that everyone will make mistakes and uh, but if we repeat this experiment for like over 100 of times and you will be correct for the most of the time and you may make different but, but here you're assuming that correct is through around zero yes, or no yes, effect. Yes, you're yes, assuming yes. that yes that the true effect is no effect yes and this is just a little bit of error on, on both sides of that right. Even then, how do you explain the second thing, which is that they cannot explain the, the variance. They cannot explain why people arrive at these very different conclusions. I'm not sure, like if it is a distribution sort of, and there is some error, maybe the error is that they're, they're the real, really predictive variable just in the data that was provided or something. Um, and some of the other correlations are spurious. I don't know. Uh, but even if we don't know what it is, 
I could still, I'm not sure we have to know what the variance is to think of things that way. But so they, they arguably they've recorded all of the things that these teams have done differently. Yet, they, even when considering all of those variables, they cannot explain the vast majority of the difference observed between the outcomes of these teams' analyses. Like, how is that possible? Copy the statistics from. I mean, I guess in, in a in a way that's the point of the paper, right? This is what they call the hidden universe of uncertainty. Right? And the point is, you know, whatever it is, we just don't know, but it happens. One thing that's maybe worth considering is like. Is the effect as strong with data that people are more familiar with, like that they collected themselves? You could argue, I mean, it's possible that people are more able to make quote unquote correct decisions when they're working with data they correctly feel correct. But I don't know, that's just speculation. Yeah. So I was wondering what would happen if they joined two teams, one from each of the size of the spectrum try to demonstrate the improve try to argue their mm -hmm. and try to I don't know have them collaborate and see what the next decision will be. Yeah yeah so they do talk about something along these lines they talk about how for each team they showed them the models or analyses or I don't know, some number of other teams, and they asked them to rate them. So basically everybody sort of, you know, rated the correction, the uh, correctness of some of the analyses and models of some of the other teams. And so there was some of this feedback in there and they did use that data, you know, as part of the, these models are trying to explain the difference. But I feel like trying to grade someone or being with the person and working with them to get to a result is probably not the same because there's a human aspect. Uh, but you know, in, in a peer review setting, this one where we're basically asked to oh, rate yeah. other people's work face value without you know even knowing who the authors are most of the time yeah that's also a realistic setting you have to make decisions about papers we're reviewing often without knowing who the authors are to bring this full circle i feel like this kind of motivates mixed methods research like thinking about it more yeah. Maybe we're just trying to answer a question that's too complicated for a bunch of numbers to explain. And this kind of speaks to how statistics can tell whatever the heck that kind of can tell, even if you use the same test on the same data. Yeah. But perhaps if there was more qualitative data done or qualitative research done about how immigration could affect it would point them in a better yeah. direction. Yeah. I, I think I agree with that point. Um, I don't know if I, I at some point, uh, I maybe made this joke, maybe on the Slack channel about, I don't know, the data scientist and the whatever, the mathematician, the data scientist always asks, you know, what do you want the answer to be? It can be anything, right? So I can massage the data to support any conclusion. I'm not sure what data they use, but 
I feel like this question is something which should have, like, it should have a binary answer, right? Like, you know how much the government is spending on people and you know how many immigrants there are. So, like, it should be something one can easily quantify. It. I'm just wondering if their data is like, so um, they talk about public support for some government policy as the oh, outcome like, here. I see, I see. So but whether that, people feel positively for it or not. Right. So it's kind of a fuzzy thing that's hard to measure objectively, I probably. See. It's kind of like elections. I see, I see. But I mean, I feel like I would kind of believe this more if they used a study which kind of had a ground truth. Mm. And then if, so someone, like the people have different opinion or like different models and they have different results. And then they're shown that this is a ground truth. Like, would they actually change it? Would mm -hmm. they go with their method and um, be willing to? Good question. The, the question is, I don't know if you're going to hear this on the, on Zoom. The question is, you know, would this look very different if there was ground truth? Would, would people be more likely to arrive at that ground truth or change their minds when presented with it? Yeah, it's a good question. Any thoughts? Do a study on the minimum, like necessary conditions for a researcher to change their mind. <laughs> yeah, because we're stubborn, right? Right. It's probably pretty. It's probably a lot. It's required. Yeah. I mean, there's a joke that like science progresses one funeral at a time. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the redacted paper that we also have to read. Wow. I can't believe it took this much for you to redact these results. <laughs> Good. So let's uh, we, we can move to that one. Any any more thoughts? Zoom folks, I didn't hear much from you. Any <laughs> thoughts on this? It, does this mean that we have to just give up? Like there's no hope? It's one way I interpreted it. <laughs> you know, like all of these things we've been learning about how to do science rigorously ultimately don't matter because the their outcome is arbitrary, seemingly. Anything in life, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and one part of the thing is to push for more transparency from people, as much as like recording, encouraging people to record the decisions they make um, if they're making decisions. Yeah. But even you know, with all of these replication packages that, that are now mandatory in software engineering, by the way, these are now mandatory. Uh, for example, ICSI, the top conference, requires open science. So papers must be accompanied by you know, public data and public analysis scripts and everything else. It's mandatory that everything be public. And even then, this means that you know anyone else looking at the same data that comes with a paper, uh, chances are would arrive at <laughs> different conclusions. I think, like, what's the point? I mean, we mentioned ground truth earlier, and I think that's an interesting thing is that if there's like an established idea of what the answer is supposed to be, that definitely influences the way you would approach analysis, I mean, consciously or otherwise. So there's so few questions, though, that have a you know, clear sure. yes or no answer like that. And usually you're not researching those. <laughs> right. Another thing I thought that was interesting about this study is that they, so they were given like data collected after the fact and then um, told to, to uh, investigate it with like a modeling method. But I'm curious to see if this applies to something that's, um, I don't know, if it's not really more rigorous, but maybe better in terms of causality, like a true experiment. Would you get similar results if you asked a bunch of scientists to do a true experiment on something that you could actually do a true experiment mm -hmm. on? Of course, this subject not being something you could do a true experiment on. Because presumably there's fewer design choices to be made in the process of analyzing that data collected from the experiment, right? Right, yeah. So I, I would be interested to see if like different research methods um, exhibit the same sort of exhibit that graph or if it's all like mm. less of a distribution. All we need to do is just recruit, I don't know, 73 more research teams. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do that much. <laughs>
I still cannot reconcile this thing about how none of the decision points they encoded explain much of the variance. Did they actually run the, like, whatever the model, the, all the research instruments? I think so. They, they talk about even uh, correcting some mistakes in, uh, I don't know, people's models or something. I, I feel that's impossible. Like, how, how, how can you do that? I, so imagine they were all sort of notebook style things, all on the same data, you know, in R, so you could just run them. Yeah, but still, like, for example, people cannot find all bugs through the code yes. review process. Yes. Yes. So I, I feel that's still something missing. Absolutely, yeah. So there's probably stuff they weren't able to capture. But I think the surprising thing to me is how much that is. Like, like even when they've captured, I don't know, they talk about how many, 100 plus, I remember, but they, I don't remember exactly how many. Oh, 107 variables, I think. Right, so they've captured 107 variables that you know, you know, capture these different decisions and variations and decisions. Even with those, most of the variance is unexplained. So sure, you know, bugs uncaught by code review certainly are part of this, I agree, but it just feels like so much is left unexplained. It's very unsatisfying. Maybe some of it, they, they said um, they had 107, but then uh, they said it is statistically inappropriate to use 107 variables when there are 87 um, team test cases. Yes. So they grouped them up and maybe there's something lost in that. I don't they, know. They did this uh, a few at a time and then they picked the most explanatory of those. They kept that and then oh, okay. added a few more at a time from the ones remaining. They talk about this at length about how they really looked at everything. Have to be 73 replications of something is like a lot, that's which is part of what makes it like that's more than you would ever actually have yeah. in science. The amount of work to put this thing together <laughs> must have been really, really massive. By the way, so many authors. Yeah. <laughs> that's the point. Did you see like the last page is just uh, all the authors? Yeah. Because like yeah. all the people that participated were listed as co authors, mm -hmm. which makes sense. The, the it's on the last page. It's like this little fine print thing at the end. So the version of meeting. Oh no no. The ones with little uh, green badges. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is about this. Um, this really you know made me upset when I when I read this. I mean, it gave me the sense of hopelessness, you know, like, it felt like it ultimately, you know, even when you do everything right, there's still so much uncertainty and variation in this, that kind of, I don't know, demotivating for something. And hopefully you have a better experience. Yeah, uh, I don't feel demotivated. Uh, good, okay, good, because that was not the intent, it's not to really depress you all. Any more thoughts on this? We could talk about the second one. Yeah, okay, let's talk about the redacted one. So do we still need to look at this? I'm gonna put it down. One thing that the authors mentioned in the conclusion, I think, or the discussion is that they're like, if you're feeling demotivated, just think about it from a different perspective and how amazing it is that we have come to some like pretty strong conclusions about other things like human induced climate change and increasing political polarization in the United States, which is kind of a cool thought. I really like that paragraph. I saw that too. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, despite I think the pessimism of the piece until then, they ended on a very positive note. Yeah, yeah. So check that out if you haven't seen that paragraph. It's the last 
paragraph of the implication section, right? Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so here I have, if you need more of these, I have a bunch of these other ones printed out and I send the digital one on Slack as well. By the way, getting an article retracted that you've authored and published, it's quite, you know, a reputational hit as a scientist. So I think it's always better to take your time and really, I don't know, trust the things you're submitting or writing than to have to go through this experience. I would not want to be uh, in, in the author's shoes, you know, even when I disagree with the authors, I still would not be in their shoes when, you know, they get their papers retracted like this. But let, okay, let's see. Look at the discussion section and skim through some of the, the methods. They talk about the methods in the results section on page two, about what they collected and what they analyzed. Why did they retract it? It's a good question. Let's, let's talk about that. It's like a weird way to find material. That certainly has to do with it. Also, Seems like it's more measuring gender discrimination, possibly than on measuring gender, some sort of inherent gender.
Oh, it's just bringing it down there again. Let's see. I, the most interesting sentence in July. Anyway. Yeah, that's on um, page six, middle of page six. Or the, actually, I think the second sentence is going to be so interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the backstory, this is a paper that got published in a very distant journal, right? Nature Communications is one of the, whatever, many nature flavors of journals, like nature is this big science journal. They have like a gazillion of these nature X, uh, you know, they're all decent journals. So this was, you know, a decent paper published in a decent journal. Um, and it hit Twitter. Uh, and people were really upset about this. Um, you know, there were petitions and whatnot, and you know, an angry Twitter mob uh, complaining about this. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, the journal announced that they're, I don't know, doing an investigation, and they uh, concluded that and retracted the paper as a result of it. Triggered by this uh, community backlash. What do you think? What did the investigation show? Well, I mean, you you see the paper. So like, what, what do you think? I mean, the, the research method seems to be very, very loosely correlated with, with what they're trying to, to measure. There are so many potential confounding factors. It doesn't seem like there's a very strong causal link between what they were the, the thing, their, their conclusions and the, the data that they gathered. So my guess is it's based on that. Uh, just, yeah, it doesn't seem to be a very strongly related, but it did get through peer review the first time. So somebody else thought it, it was strongly related enough to publish. I mean, peer review is also an imperfect process. It's true. Yeah. But what's wrong with it? Is there anything wrong with it? I mean, I think it's a bad construct for mentorship. That's the first thing it says. Um, because being on multiple, it was, was it 20 or more author papers? Is that what it said? I, yeah, you, they put it. You, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I was going to say, or more, that's even weirder. Oh, yeah. 20 or more, you may work with a lot of like, 
I am on papers with multiple sustainer. I wouldn't consider it like I'm going for it. They, they said paper, they excluded papers with 20 or more co-authors, yeah. so kind of like the first one we've read, uh, you know, yeah. papers that have tons of people on them for probably other reasons than actual collaboration. Also with like what, well, and they also didn't really have a strong theoretical motivation. It didn't feel like so much of this, like why, well, and to me that's important because in a large data set like this, you may be able to find um, trends that are there. Like you can look at census data and find a statistical significance, even if it's not necessarily something caric to the group. And 20 yeah. or more, like that's, it, it's good that they're excluding 20 or more, but even like 15 authors, <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. I, I'm surprised they chose the threshold so high. The other thing is, then, did they? I maybe missed this. Did they focus on a specific field, or was it multiple fields? Multiple fields. The data uh, spans fields. They talked about what the fields are somewhere. Um, I don't recall. There's a, a number of fields. Citation rate is so different. How many oh, people publish yeah. is different. It's kind of. Yeah. really different if you're comparing different fields that also seems to be something they, the comparison as i understand it was done within fields okay so they, there's some sort of matching process where they match the people with fancy big shots mentorship to people with less of that you know accounting for these other variables um so th there is some attempt to you know to do this with right with some of these components uh, biology, chemistry, computer science, economics, engineering, geology, material science, medicine, physics, and psychology. Computer science is so strange compared to other fields and the way people publish for me that it's just yeah. weird to include your own but that's... I think the thing that I just found not great about this article was I think mostly just the discussion section. I feel like the way that they talk about the implications is with such certainty of like, this implies that, you know, like that, you know, like female proteges should actually be paired up with like male proteges based on the data that they have, which I think someone mentioned, I think it might've been you that mentioned this just kind of looks like maybe evidence of like systemic disadvantage of women in science yeah. and yeah. like they I did see a sentence where they said of course this could be explained by you know like the fact that like men have um benefit a lot from privilege in this discipline but it's like literally one sentence and like I don't know the last page or something that I I don't even think I could find again if I skipped quickly so I feel like it may have been worth to dive into multiple explanations and give it thought and then not make such a strong recommendation based on the data that they do have. Mm -hmm. um, I think I that's where I found this was problematic. I, going off of your point, I think because the conclusion is so like, I think like, I, don't, I mean, I can't, I'm so annoyed by this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so attention grabbing. Like if I said that, okay, I use GPT-3 on Stack Overflow data, and my accuracy is nine, where it's actually like five or something. Not many people would care much about it. Mm. But if I say men mentors are better and women make you unsuccessful in life, yeah. I'm going to refute that. I'm going to put take out time in my day and like find out flaws in your methodology. Methodology, and that makes me angry. Like so, so, so. This is a really good point. Okay, so let me ask this. Like I'm going to play devil's advocate for for a second. You know, we obviously all have our, you know, beliefs and political views and biases of all kinds of natures, right? Um, it, at what point is it inappropriate for us to you know, inject those in to peer review, say? Like, what is, you know, methodologically or, or numerically wrong with this analysis, you know, with the statistics? With the data they collected, with whatever, what is you know fundamentally wrong with that, right? Um, you know, what if their conclusions are actually supported by the data and the analysis, even if we disagree with them? I mean, you can just start off by saying that citation count is not really representative of success. That I mean, yeah, it's very obvious. Like I bet this paper will get a lot of citations and. Uh, and <laughs> In studies of, of examples of, of 
problematic papers. It's like you say that, <laughs> and it already. I would check the citations, and both of them are talking about these sorts of issues. So yeah. there's two citations. Of it. Um, I also think along those lines, more like qualitatively, when it comes to the sort of what you were going to get, like the balance of interpretation, I think is important along those lines in, in the sense of um, like, I could see this paper, like a, the discussion sec section, which like really like similar to how you said, just like it really bothered me. Um, I think one particular part of it was like right near the end where it's like uh, maximizing your long-term scientific impact. Um, and like, I think it's, it's it, that you could take these results and conclude that the way to like, that, that this is indicative of current um, efforts to counteract gender bias not being enough and that you need to do more. Um, but in this particular, like that they're, they're only taking the one side of um, these efforts aren't going anywhere. And I think that like, in, it seems fair to me if, if you have a, a case where it's like a meta-analysis that isn't where like you have multiple views on something and the data doesn't rule out any of them and the authors are taking like one clear particular view of the many and not speaking of the others and that it seems fair to criticize them for that. So, okay so that but i think that's the point though right the point is to me i think um it seems when we talk about science that we talk about this Assuming we haven't read the previous paper about how it's really not objective at all, but when we talk about science, we talk about this you know, objective thing that is void of context and void of politics and void of beliefs, right? It's, it's the numbers, it's whatever the numbers show. It should be irrelevant, you know, what I believe in, right? The numbers point in some direction or they don't, right? What I believe in should be irrelevant, right? Separating that from, you know, these qualitative, subjective, unavoidable interpretations that the human researchers have to make of the data they're looking at right so i think that's really interesting it's interesting to me you know at some point do you draw where do you draw the line like where is it you know uh, where is it okay to reject a paper that you don't agree with philosophically or politically even if you know the numbers seem to be okay right i think i think the issue i mean um, and I, I think the reason that this paper in particular got attention is because it's a very dis divisive issue. Absolutely. Uh, but the, I, if you're going to make a very divisive claim, the claim should probably be best, better supported than it is. There, I, 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 one of the things we talked about in our causality thing is you're supposed to eliminate all alternative explanations, yeah. and they didn't do that. They just picked an explanation and went with it. Um, and so if if the conclusion in this paper is true, there should be more evidence to eliminate alternative explanations in the results. So maybe that's that's part of the, the fundamental issue here. Oh, I was going to say, in all fairness, they did put it in the discussion section. So like, you know, there's clear that it was some sort of interpretation. Yeah. But yeah. I think they just spent a lot of time entertaining one point of view and then just said, oh, yeah, these are like other hypotheses and then just like didn't really. I found it. It's like literally like this That's little so chunk here where they said, oh, yeah, there are other explanations, but so, then left. So they, 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 they did. They kind of did a token acknowledgement yeah. of other viewpoints, but it's not actually or or other other interpretations, but they didn't actually do a proper acknowledgement of other interpretations. Isn't this the Elon Musk free speech thing? <laughs> you know, the, the numbers are the numbers. They do make a token acknowledgement of other explanations. They, they go with the one they like. Free, free speech, like who are you to, to, you know, to, to retract this or to criticize this? I think there's a way to write this paper where it didn't have to be retracted. If you like didn't if they like ex used methods to explore some of these options or were less um, strong. I mean, I guess it's the paradox of tolerance, um, which is if you tolerate all intolerance, mm. then you're not. <laughs> being tolerant to anyone 
Um, so you kind of have to pick a boundary and a point where you're okay accepting. So I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, anyway. yeah. I think the other thing though is like, I don't know if the Elon comparison is necessarily applicable because they think companies have very different priorities than like science, right? And I would argue that like, if you look at like things like the Belfont report and like stuff, Belfont, Belmont, something like that, like where it's very clear where people think that science should be in the service of people and humanity, right? And I think the motivations of Elon maybe might not arguably be there because he has other motives as well, right? Financial motives. So I don't know. Like, I, I guess my point was, you know, if you believe in free speech, um, um, and you know, th this is one of many interpretations of this data, probably the incorrect one, because you know, there's all these plausible alternative explanations they didn't account for. But it is one possible interpretation of the data, you know, and they do make a token acknowledgement of other interpretations, right? Like, isn't this, you know, at what point do you draw the line that, that, that this should not be published? Like, at what point does it become political and not scientific anymore? Is what I'm asking. I kind of disagree that the issue is with the interpretation of the data. And I think the issue is with what is the data itself? Like my issue is, I disagree that, I think they shouldn't be allowed to use the word mentor and protege, period. Mm. Their definition of a mentor is like a senior co-op. And their definition of mentorship quality is like average citations of your senior co-author. And then they say in the discussion session that women are spending too much time on committees. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, that was weird. That's insane. For me, I think, there is an objective issue with this paper, which is what you claim as a mentor is not actually a mentor. And the framing of your data is just purely invalid, mm. regardless of the gender issue and the political you know, stance. I feel yeah. like a lot of this work was done with confirmation bias. They just wanted to see this and they analyzed the data with that bias as well. And like, that's how they collected the data as well. Like why, in what world would you, like if I had some co-authors, in what world would they have affected me if I worked with them, like X, Y, Z? Well, in all fairness, you know, they do make an attempt to validate that this senior co-author relationship reflects some notion of mentorship. They ran some survey and they asked the protégés if, you know, they were in fact mentored along some the dimensions by the senior co-author and they had you know a large agreement by and large so they, they, there is some attempt to validate the construct now i actually agree that this is not that they're over claiming but i feel like they feel that called i agree with you personally they shouldn't have called it mentorship. but I mean, fundamentally if if they just call this you know co-authorship more strictly and more subtly alluded at mentorship in the discussion section, maybe, and this is prominently throughout the paper. Would that have been acceptable otherwise? I think if they would have considered someone you work with, but it's good to like your advisor, I think that would have made more sense than a person who wasn't. Like, I mean, I don't know. Like, are you affected by any of your reports? What? Do you work by your they, they say that the people they ask say they are. They, but only been... like 90 something out of the 160 people Correct. say that. So that's not a well, I think I, sorry, I feel this this is more about the conclusion is instead of the like process. Like the, the conclusion should be we should improve the quality, we should improve the awareness, and we should provide more resources to the instead of assigning like female mentees to male mentors. Yeah. Like, like for example, you can have been like, I don't know, we should move all people from developing countries to developed countries. Mm. That can be one conclusion made based on, I don't know, people are healthier mm. in developed countries. So but that's not the, the, the conclusion you should make. Mm. So I, I feel that's the 
problem. I kind of like, I, I miss up, this was said earlier, but um, the the point that they, at least there's, there's no um, explicitly stated theory here. They just like take some, so they're not testing a theory. They just take some data, analyze it in a kind of questionable way. It's very loose. The fact that like um, what as um, uh, a mentor is, is that really a mentor relationship? It's, it's not a very strong, um, all the relationships are weak and they pound, compound weak relationship on, weak, on top of weak, weak relationship to try to pull some sort of correlation there out of a big data set, which is not something you should do to begin with. Um, and then they make a very strong divisive conclusion off of a very weak post hoc analyzed data set. So there's, there's little problems all along the way that add up to a very, uh, or, you know, no, no studies ever perfect. You no, know, no, that's true. Flaws. I, I do think there's an important point, which is that often, and it's, I don't think that is the case with this paper, like being charitable. I don't think there was any intention to be like, I don't think they think they were being discriminatory. But I think the flip side is like discrimination and over bad, <laughs> very polit political social policy can hide behind the guise of science. And a perfect example of that is the bell curve by uh, Charles Murray and some dead guy. Um, they're, they're, <laughs> I'm not going to respect them. Um, now, they have, there's way more problems with the bell curve than this, but their case is basically taking like IQ scores are different between black and white people, and therefore we should make all these radical social policy changes like um, getting rid of the welfare state. And that's a very uh, like extreme example, but I think that's kind of the point that like, you know, um, it's political, but I think science is political to a certain degree and you have to make these decisions at what point does the methodology no longer justify the divisive conclusions. That's really the point of this last week, right? Is to acknowledge that we cannot separate out you know, the, the context in which we're doing science, the people that are doing the science from the maybe objective science itself. Yeah, so I, I agree with that by reading the paper today. But I, I agree with this interpretation. I guess one thing, uh, one other thing I wanted to ask, you know, uh, you mentioned this earlier about how you found it so annoying, right, that you would take time out of your day, you know, to, <laughs> to, to, you know show what's wrong with this, right? So, what if, you know, what happens to all of the other papers whose conclusions we happen to agree with, right? This one, maybe by and large, we happen to disagree with. What happens to all the ones that just confirm something we believe in? Like what happens during peer review, et cetera? Like, do they get away with really crappy science just because they happen to arrive at a conclusion we like? Because probably we're not going to, you know, take time out of our day to really to scrutinize those. If, uh, we happen to like what they're saying, right? And this was also an all fairness peer review and accepted in nature. So that's, and some people thought this was good initially. Yeah, I would certainly guess that there's, um, I guess uh, earlier I said that the reason that we identified the problems with this one was because it was politically divisive. So we got a lot of attention and people analyzed it. Um, but most there's, I'm, I would certainly, based on no data, conjecture that there is a fair amount of research that does come to questionable conclusions that isn't divisive, so it doesn't get a lot of attention uh, and therefore doesn't. During peer review, should we hold papers on the divisive topics, sensitive topics to a higher standard of science than other papers? But it almost has to be, in, in, this is not a suggestion of changing anything, but it almost has to be the opposite because um, divisive papers already get tons of attention. So it's the non-divisive papers where it's easier to like sneak through. No, but I mean, so here, right, we, we read this say, and we're like, oh yeah, but you know, I can think of a few possible alternative explanations you haven't convinced me you excluded, you know, go back and do all of those. Whereas if the paper were, you know, less political, right? If it was, I don't know, some model on stack overflow data, you know, who cares? Like, what's the harm, right? So, whatever, right? So, that's the question. Like, should we 
you know, hold work on sensitive topics to a higher standard of, I don't know, integrity or, or rigor than, yeah, than average work on, on average topics. I mean, like, it's kind of like how, like, I don't know, there was a Usenix security paper that was accepted and then retracted for ethics reasons. And this is a big problem with ethics. I feel like it's a similar sort of issue with like IRB problems where just because something was approved as ethical initially doesn't mean that it should actually be accepted. And so maybe like um, in a similar way that there are now like committees to review those sorts of questions, maybe you're right that there should be something for like really divisive, strong conclusions like that. Is that fair? Is it fair to the know. authors who choose to work on, you know, harder, more divisive questions, right? That they're held to a higher standard than other scientists. I'm willing to say it's fair. Me too. I think, I mean, to like make a really stupid analogy, like air, airline pilots have to go through hundreds of hours of training, you know, because if they fall asleep at the wheel or make a mistake, they're going to kill hundreds of people, like guarantee you. Whereas a car driver, like any 15 year old can go and put a couple of lives at risk. But, you know, we've accepted that as a society. Mm. And similarly, I think if the impact of your work is significant, maybe you should be held to a higher standard. Mm. And I also think that also detracts the, from the quality of existing peer review necessarily, right? Like you might, at least like the mental framing that I would apply would be like, our standards for existing papers that maybe aren't so divisive or things like that already high, I would hope. And it's maybe just that this one would just be even higher. And I guess like, cause I guess in my mind, the, the danger of a potential frame really, is it fair, is it not fair? The implication is that for all the other papers, maybe it's all cruddy, right? And I, I would like to believe that maybe it's, even if it's higher yeah. than average, mm -hmm. right? The question, it, it's a fairness question. Is it fair, you know, to the authors that work on less divisive topics that, you know, that they can, or sorry, is it fair to the authors that work on political topics that they are held to a higher standard still than the otherwise high standard of the community already? But there's always a trade-off, right? Like if I work on something like this, I get more recognition. And if I work on word on status quo, mm -hmm. like 20 people, but here, like, there's a Twitter war on your work. Twitter. I mean, we got retracted, but you're also working on very popular things. Plus, is life fair? Say that again, Courtney. I said, like, plus, is life fair? Or is it, like, fair for the potential people who they could impact with their research? Like, I don't know. But I'm, so, I think I personally, I think I agree with this, but you know, authors do make this argument, right? In, in peer review, you know, why should we be held to a higher standard than the average paper that you know is published in this venue when it comes to whatever, you know, the methods and whatnot, right? Like these other people that have published similar studies using similar methods on different topics, plus political, we're not asked to do any of these additional things that you're asking us to do. You know, like what, what, how is that fair to us? But I think the question does come up, uh, you know, in, in peer review. I mean, think about the ivermectin stuff and like the really poor studies that came out during COVID, like if you, and that are still used as mis for, to promote like incorrect claims um, about like vaccines and stuff. So uh, I don't know, it's, if you could stop those sorts of papers from being out there, that I think that might be a good thing. Because for better or for worse, we're not just like sitting in a room just talking to academics. It's going to be on the internet and be used by people. Yeah. I think that's sort of why I think my main problem with this paper, regardless of the subject matter, because of the discussion section will be the most easily accessible part of the paper. I think you have more of a, like a higher degree to or bar of, of responsibility to me making sure that you accurately and broadly address the potential takes that you could have on the results. Mm -hmm. cool. Cool. Okay, so we're we're past. So let's let's stop. Thanks for engaging. Two more at least really dramatic on Thursday, more of this.
Hopefully this was fun. Next time we should have coffee. <laughs> It's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>